All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Keith Michael Isaki. I'm with GTC Systems. Welcome to GTC's weekly seminar slash webinar, uh, which is an event we do every week uh, on a certain technology update. And we do it both at a seminar at our office and also we provide it as a webinar. It's also recorded, so that means if you like to watch it, if you miss certain parts, you like to watch it in the future, feel free, of course, to ask us for it, and we will provide you the link. Today, we have our good friends from N Computing. It's uh, amazing technology uh, using thin clients um, that is basically a game changer. And I will turn it now to Cece from N Computing to introduce her team who are here and tell us more about it. Great. Thank you so much. Oh. Just, uh, really glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to introduce my team to you in the room as well as on the webcast. Um, I am the partner manager. I work closely with GTC Systems and um, I really enjoyed getting to work with their account managers and meeting a lot of the customers. I also have with me Dave Jolly. He is our senior systems engineer, so he is uh, the brains of this operation today, and uh, he can field any questions you've got technically. In addition, we have the pleasure of Chris Verna in the room. He is your senior account manager who any customers uh, that uh, GTC needs assistance with that, that they want to jointly talk to clients with, he's here and able to help answer any questions as well. So as our uh, introductions have started, let me get right into it. So uh, just by a show of hands with those in the room here, and Computing, are you familiar with the company, with the organization? A couple are, a couple aren't. Let me step that back to a different question. How about thin clients? Do you use thin clients in any capacity in your organization? Okay, so we've got some, some uh, thin client users, some not, so we can kind of go into that. Moving my slide deck forward. No, that's all right. So I'm just going to start a little bit, uh, tell you a little bit about Ant Computing. So um, we are a provider of thin clients, as I probably said the word quite a few times today. We've been working pretty closely with GTC now for probably getting close to two years, and um, had many successful deployments um, working with our team. Really enjoyed working with them. We have been around as an organization for about, uh, I think we're coming up on about eight years now. We started with a legacy line of products. So we had thin clients and realized there's this space that you need access to your environment that's secure. And we started off in that. We developed a strong relationship with Citrix, being that we have multiple people that have come over from Citrix Senior Management into our organization, made a big bet, if you will, to create a thin client that would work specifically for Citrix. And so what we did is took the um, Citrix receiver and put that right onto a system on a chip. This device that I'm going to talk about today is specific to Citrix, and we'll show you how you can create a world-class end-user experience with this device at a very low cost compared to what you might be doing now. All right, so there's our company overview. Um, we are worldwide. We're about 300 people strong, most of us based in California, um, up and down the coast. Uh, we have over 60,000 customers in 140 countries. So we're able to support a lot of that through our organization here in the West, but we also do have regional offices around the world. So we've been around a little while, we're established, and we've got a lot of thin clients out in use today. Talk about our global presence. Um, IDC, as well as Gartner and many of the analyst firms speak highly of the thin client business and kind of where that marketplace is going. So I highlight one of the quotes here from them that, you know, it's a good, good value, easy to use, plug right into your centric environment. As I mentioned, so we're very, very tightly ingrained with Citrix. Our CEO, a gentleman by the name of Raj Dingra, he's been on board with us for about three years. He was the general manager of the desktop virtualization practice for Citrix. Saw this opportunity to come over and said, let's figure out how to kind of make this lower cost Citrix thin client. And um, that's exactly what we've done. So this team you've got in front of you today has basically come on to enable that and make sure that, especially in the West Coast, you guys are all covered off. We can show you the value of the tool, and um, there you go. 
we have three units here. And one thing with thin clients that you might or might not know, other thin client providers that are out there, I'm pretty sure some of you are probably working with them, haven't worked with them, whatnot. You run into a situation where you're not sure where to go. So you've got the Citrix environment, you've got to have an endpoint. What's your best way to go? Are you going to go PCs? Are you going to do it? Uh, try to use the stuff that you've already got. We have another way of doing that, which is the thin client. We offer three units here. Um, bells, whistles, whatnot is our N500, and that will allow you to allow your users uh, different monitoring situations, wireless, so kind of any capacity that your users might need to access your Citrix environment securely. We have two other units, the N500 and N400, and that, that is it. So it's you're pretty much picking how much power do your users need, what the requirements are, and that's those are all three offered. So I am going to talk about some of the real world challenges, but I'm actually going to have you do it, Dave. How do you Perfect. Do you? I like that. Do you mind if I if I take that lab mic instead of this? Do you need to get a new level? So how many of you guys are aware of the history of VDI? How many of you know where VDI started, or who started it, or how it originated? Not many people do. Um, back in 2004, there was actually an insurance company in Minneapolis who went to VMware and said, we want to take this gigantic IBM server that's capable of hosting hundreds and hundreds of virtual workloads. Did you turn it off? Did I turn it off? Can they hear us? No, it's still on. It's still on. Can you level? Check, or check. I can't hear you. Uh, you stay. Test. Sorry, technical difficulties. So th this insurance company in Minneapolis actually approached VMware and said, we've got this gigantic server or this series of gigantic servers, and we want to host XP workstations on these gigantic servers and use RDP as a connection protocol. And that was really the birth of VDI, and that's when VMware said, we we've got this idea that we can market this. We can create a solution out of this. And so a whole bunch of connection brokers were, were created. Propero and Provision Networks and LeoStream, a lot of those were acquired. Citrix was the original VDI with Metaframe, WinFrame, back to the old, old days. So in 2007, when, when VDI really started to get this marketing propaganda built up behind it, um, everybody talked about it. Everybody loved it. Everybody wanted VDI. And a lot of people base their careers on VDI, saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to change careers and be a VDI specialist. I'm going to be a VDI architect. The problem with that is it never took off like everybody hoped it would. And part of the reason for that was because the cost of the endpoint device. So in 2012, Mark Templeton, who is the CEO of Citrix, stood up at Synergy Barcelona and issued a challenge to all of the thin client vendors in the world and said exactly that, that the problem with VDI adoption is that the endpoint devices are too expensive. Be that a thin client, a PC, a laptop, whatever the endpoint device is, it's been too expensive. So he issued this challenge to create devices that were purpose-built for Citrix that would be sub $200. to actually create this, and that's kind of what we're doing with this market is, is disrupting it and making it so that VDI is finally acceptable. It's finally achievable because now it's not going to be a $1,500 or a $2,000 per user proposition. Now we've brought the price of the endpoint down so low that it's actually achievable. So if we look at the, um, the reasons that, uh, that it's been a, a, a challenge is... Um, and you have to forgive me, this, uh, this, this slide was reordered, and, uh, and it's not, uh, not the order I'm used to it. But So if, if we look at delivering a rich, secure desktop experience, in the past, in order to be able to do that, you've needed to have either a full-blown PC or you've needed to have a really, really feature-rich thin client that is about the same price as a PC. Right? And so when you start talking about thin clients that are purpose-built, we are a system on chip. Does everybody know what a system on chip is? Does anyone know the term ASIC? Some of you nerds in the room might know what an ASIC is. An ASIC is basically, it's an acronym that stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. It is a very, very small chipset 
that is purpose-built, designed to do one thing and to do it well. When you start talking about building circuitry to do one thing, it, it benefits in a couple of different ways. One, the performance is fantastic because that's all that that circuit is capable of doing. And the price is incredibly low because that's all that it's built to do. So you don't have to build this wildly complex, comprehensive solution like you talk about a, you know, an Intel uh, microprocessor. Uh, that's capable of doing, you know, 7 billion things when you only need it to do 200 things. And so it, it ends up in the economies of scale when you start talking about systems on chip actually becomes very, very beneficial. And so one of the things that we do with, with our solution is we have the ability to deliver that rich desktop experience because it is, it's not an ASIC, it's a system on chip, but it's very near an ASIC. The reducing the cost, the Numo 3 system on chip set that we use, um, does everybody understand the benefits of using system on chip? Okay, so, so when it comes down to supportability and feature rich uh, capabilities, when you, when you deal with a system on chip, um, all of the peripheral devices, the input output drivers, the displays, the network, the, 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 the uh, drive access, it's all built into one single chip instead of having different chips for each of the different subsystems. And the problem with having a system that has multiple vendors or multiple different chipsets is if there's an issue with a device, do you know is it the software or is it perhaps the network driver? And if it's the network driver, do you have to go to Realtek to get a new driver issue? Do you have to go to Realtek to find, find, uh, find the problem or go to Marvell or whoever's actually created that chipset? So the big benefit of system on chip is everything is in the one chip the drivers, the, uh, all of the, the peripheral support, it's all in one chip, which makes it a lot easier to support and, uh, and increases performance dramatically. Uh, I, I didn't get the clicker. Which one is forward? That one? All right. So the traditional methodology, when you start going VDI or even old school server-based computing or whatever method you're going, there, there are traditionally um, three different mind frames, three different schools of thought uh, for how to approach the endpoint device, the, what, what's actually sitting in front of the customer. The first one is the traditional PC refresh cycle, which might be three years, four years, five years, depending on how your finance budget looks. Um, so that's one of the, one of the, the traditional approaches. The, the problem with that and why our devices, uh, why our solution is better is that our devices are less expensive than even the least expensive PC. That and the fact that it's a solid state device, no moving parts, has a mean time between failure of, of about 19.8 years, um, which is, a, I think it's 120,000 hours mean time between failure. What that means is the PC refresh cycle, which was traditionally 36 months, you can now extend that to 48 months or maybe even 60 months because these devices aren't going to die like your PCs have, like the power supplies and the fans and the hard drives in your PCs have. Because when you start looking at why the PC refresh cycle has traditionally been three years or four years or five years, it's oftentimes because that's the mean between failure. That, that you, you've determined that that's, you know, devices are failing about every three years or every four years, so we're going to start replacing them just before they fail or just after you're expecting them to fail. But when you have a device that doesn't fail that often, you can actually extend that. And what that does for the financial aspect is it makes it so that not only is the device cheaper to acquire, but now you're spreading that inexpensive price over a longer period of time, which actually reduces the endpoint device cost even more. <clears throat> because it's a purpose-built device, um, we don't have the traditional attack vectors that a PC would. So you don't have to worry about malware. You don't have to worry about viruses. There is nothing to attack on these devices. You're still going to protect your back end, of course, because that's a Windows environment, and that's the, the primary target for any attack. So you're still going to protect the back end, but the, the front end, you don't have to worry about protecting. So there's an additional reduced cost there. There's an additional reduction in the management time and the management effort when you don't have to patch these devices. You don't have to update them. You don't have to worry about the, the newest virus definitions. These devices are set it and forget it. You plug it in, turn it on, walk away, and it does its job for 20 years. So the second idea, or the second school of thought, would be to take a PC, to take a traditional PC that may be coming to the end of its life cycle, it might be coming to the end of its refresh, 
And instead of refreshing it, maybe you're going to put $100 into it and replace the hard drive, or you're going to, you're going to replace the power supply and try and extend its life and turn it into kind of a, a thin client. Uh, the problem with that is when you start talking about turning a PC into a thin client, it is not a thin client. It's kind of a, it's a chubby client. It's a big boned client, whatever you want to call it. But it's not truly a thin client because you still have all of the same problems that you had with the PC. You have the fans, you have the hard drives, you have the moving parts, you have the dry throat. And so when you start talking about repurposing old PCs, it's a great idea, but it's largely a romantic idea because it's not going to work the way you expect it to work. It's a lot of effort, and oftentimes those devices are still going to fail. You replace the power supplies, you think you're going to get an extra year out of the device, you might get a couple of months and then something else is going to fail. And then you start talking about dropping $100 into a, into a hard drive, that actually you know, changes the, the cost of acquisition. That and the fact that they're not optimized for a virtualization environment. It's still a PC. And you still have to manage it. You still have to protect it. You still have to worry about any attack surfaces that might be on the device. So the third school of thought is um, to actually use just temporary or impromptu workstations, kind of doing like a hotel, hoteling situation where people can bounce from PC to PC. These are... Um, not easy to manage. Um, they're difficult to set up, and oftentimes it requires hundreds of devices to do that. And again, because you're, you're, you're dealing with the same type of Windows environment, you have all of the same issues, the management, the cost, the failures. Any questions about that? <clears throat> so the Numo 3 chip, um, the big benefit here is that this is our chip. This is our design. This is our fab. This is our manufacturing. This is our chip. We designed this chip to do exactly what it's doing. We wrote the circuitry. We fabricated it. We pressed the silicone. This is every, everything about this chip is us. There have been some thin client and zero client vendors who have developed system on chip systems since we released. The big issue with them is that they don't actually own their own chip. They've used TI chips. They've used some, some off-the-shelf chip, or they've used some type of uh, FPGA to actually make it do what, what you want it to do. They don't own the chip. They don't own the technology. We do, and it was purpose-built. The power consumption, because this is system on chip, it's very near to an ASIC. The power consumption is on the order of about one of those little tiny Christmas lights, the little ones on your Christmas tree about five watts of electricity this device will take. So very, very low power consumption. Of course, with the low power consumption means there's not a lot of heat. So you're going to have a lot less heat. You're going to have a lot less noise. And so we've actually had customers who have uh, who've replaced a, a library or replaced a computer lab of 30 or 50 or 75 PCs, put these devices in place, and, and there are two or three things they notice. The first thing they notice is, man, this room is really quiet now because there are no fans, there are no moving parts. People can study better. You know, the, the environment is more conducive to, to actually learning or to thinking or to working. They've also noticed that it's really, really cold in that room now because they didn't have all of the heat that was generated by those PCs, but they still had the same air conditioning settings. They still had the same power on the roof to actually cool the room. And so they ended up saving money on electricity, saving money on cooling, and it was a more conducive work environment. But just because of noise and heat, just because it's a, you know, a super, super simple little device. So it is a, a, a derivative of Linux. It is an ARM chipset. What that buys us, two things. Um, obviously, ARM is a very, very powerful processing technology. It's, it's very, very good. The instruction sets are, are very, very, um, I don't want to say state of the art, but they're very, very acceptable, very, very safe. The way we develop the, uh, the actual device and the, 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 the Citrix receiver is we, we've got a very close partnership with Citrix. They develop the Citrix receiver for Linux on ARM. They hand it to us, and we burn it into our chip. When you start talking about other types of thin clients, other types of zero clients, um, 
oftentimes because it is a proprietary operating system or it's a uh, it's it's an operating system that Citrix doesn't necessarily support they will actually take the Citrix receiver from Citrix and they'll have to rewrite it they'll have to open it up they'll have to license the API to be able to rewrite the receiver for their operating system or for that their platform one of the big benefits to doing it this way is that if a feature is supported by Citrix when we get that receiver it is immediately supported by our device because we don't change anything in their code. It is Citrix code that's running on our device, which helps in the really, really close partnership that we have with Citrix. It's one of the, one of the devices they really, truly believe in. So when you start talking about having dozens of these devices or hundreds of these devices or thousands or ten thousands of these devices, you start to wonder how to manage them. You know, if I've got hundreds of these devices scattered all over the world or all over the state or all over a campus, how am I going to control them? How am I going to configure them? How am I going to inventory them? We have a management tool uh, that we call vSpace Management Center that's all web-based um, that allows these devices to be configured, managed, inventoried, controlled, uh, updated, downdated, to be completely controlled remotely from, any w from the web. Um, there are a, a couple of different ways to think about managing thin clients. There's a, a passive management method, which would be you plug a device in and you turn it on and it goes out to the network and finds what it needs and configures itself and you don't have to touch it. Self-configuring, self-enrolling. That's a fantastic implementation methodology. The other way to think about management of thin, thin devices is a more active approach, where you plug a device in, turn it on, it configures itself, but then you have a, a mechanism through which you can reach out to the device, and you can actively manage this device. You can change things about it. You can update it. You can assign a profile that perhaps sends it to a development test server, and then when their testing is done, you can reach back out actively and assign it to the production server and actually do this from the comfort of your own desk or from your boat or wherever you happen to be because it's all web-based. Any questions about that? Yeah. Well, so the, the devices have part of the, uh, part of the SSC, there's an agent that's embedded in the chip that communicates with the management center. And so it's using XML and HTTPS traffic over, over uh, port 1284. And so when these devices turn on, yeah, it's not advertised. It, it's a directed broadcast. They reach into the server and say, hey, I'm here. Here's all of my information. Like you say, MAC address, serial number, versions, profiles, everything. And then the, 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 uh, the management server keeps that in a, in a database. And then in the future, whenever you need to make a change to the device, when the device checks in, it will actually take that instruction and do what it's told to do. And that is all from a technical standpoint. Um, I know Cece wanted to talk about some of these particular use cases and some of the customer success stories that we had. Before I give her the mic, do you guys have any Questions from a technical standpoint? Yeah, so, so Microsoft. Oh, okay, so the question was, do we, do we support Microsoft Link? <clears throat> the key to that question is the video conferencing. So the video conferencing is currently not supported, and that has a lot to do with the fact that this is an ARM processor, and the, the codecs that are required to do that video encoding and decoding currently are not supported on, on the ARM platform. So we will support Link, or we do support Link text-based. Uh, the video piece is not there yet. We're still working with Microsoft to actually develop the, the, the necessary connectors to be able to do that decoding. So the question is, um, with regards to higher, uh, higher end video processing and people virtualizing GPUs, do we have something that will actually take advantage of that advanced GPU processing power? Um, so we, we don't have on our roadmap any GPU type 
um, facility on the device itself. And, and part of the reason for that is the testing we've done has shown that once you start virtualizing a GPU in the back end, the performance on the front end without a GPU on the front end is significantly boosted. So even without a, a front end GPU, the performance when you start talking about, I'm assuming you're talking about like the, the, the grid, NVIDIA's grid, um, when you start putting one of those cards in a server, it's night and day, night and day. And the, the, the thing, what really happens there is our idea is to take the burden of any of the math, any of the processing away from the desktop. The desktop shouldn't be doing any heavy lifting at all. It should all be done in the back end. And the HDX protocol is so... Um, so powerful nowadays that it, it, it shouldn't it should be able to send anything you have down to the device now when you start talking about things like HDX 3d pro that does require some really heavy front-end stuff right and so currently we don't support the HDX 3d pro but everything in the HDX line up to 3d pro is supported and actually works very very well on our devices we do yeah on the on the 500 series we have dual monitor support We have we actually have a pretty extensive peripheral a supported peripheral database on our on our website, and the thing to think about <clears throat> is when it comes to peripherals, there's not much that the client is doing. Right, you plug a peripheral in, and the client advertises to the back end, "Hey, I've got this peripheral." Here's the USB ID. Here's all the information you need. Do you have drivers to support it? If you do, great. I'm going to hand this USB traffic straight up to the server. The client doesn't do any manipulation of the traffic. It doesn't do any reading of the traffic. It literally is like a traffic cop and just takes the traffic from the USB bus, sends it across the, the wire via HDX up to the server, and the server figures out what to do with it. So from a, from a supportability standpoint, um, I, I don't want to say that any peripheral will work because obviously there's going to be something that, that doesn't work, but the vast majority of the standard peripherals that people are going to use are going to be supported and they're going to work just fine because of the advanced technology and the advanced stage of the HDX protocol and what Citrix has been able to do over the last 18, 20 years. Yeah, question. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, notice that we're ARM and that we're Linux, so does that mean that the receiver versions that we get from Citrix are the same as the Linux receiver versions that Citrix releases? And the, the answer is yes and no. Um, so if, if you think about the way Citrix develops their features, and if you look at their fe feature parity between the different versions of receiver, the number one development target for Citrix is the Windows client, the Win, Win64 client. The number two is Mac. The number three is the mobile platforms. Number four is Linux for i386. Number five is Linux for ARM. So because the, the Linux ARM Citrix receiver market is still a pretty, pretty small addressable market, Citrix hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't raised the ARM receiver to the top of the list. So you are going to notice that when, uh, let's say, that uh, something magic is released in version 15 of the receiver for Windows, it might be a handful of months before that feature is introduced into the Linux version, and maybe a couple of months after that before it's introduced into the ARM version. But what we're finding is that um, a lot of these features that Citrix releases, um, the typical user is not going to have a need for them. You know, it's, it's going to be the, the user who has um, you know, a, a really advanced technical use case where they need the horsepower, where they've got 12 monitors, where they've got you know, seven workstations under their desk. Those are the guys that typically need most of those new features. And so we haven't had many complaints knowing that the new feature Citrix releases is a handful of months behind the first release for Windows. Not many people complain about that uh, just because by the time it hits the Linux version of the receiver, Citrix has worked out any bugs and it's oftentimes a more stable uh, feature release also. Any other questions? 
All right, well, I'm going to hand it over to Cece. I'm going to talk about some uh, use cases and some uh, some success stories that we've had. Great. Excellent. If you want to feel free to comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So we've got a pretty good technical understanding of why thin clients, why in computing, and kind of where we're at. As I mentioned earlier, we have approximately 60,000 customers in 140 countries. So I wanted to highlight just a couple of the typical use cases that uh, you see our thin clients into. And um, I think for some of you in the room, that, that will apply because we've got some manufacturing, some different things. I'll start out with Southern Georgia Medical Center. So healthcare is a big use case for us. And um, what you get there are large organizations with environments that are spread out all over with very, very sensitive data that can only be accessed by certain types of users based on government regulations, based on uh, based on whatever it is that they need to um, secure that data in that environment. So um, sub, sorry, South Georgia Medical Center was one of those where they had a new uh, facility coming on board. They wanted to find a way to most cost effectively bring on these types of users. And thin clients were the way they decided to go. With implementing our solution, they realized um, cost savings of 40%, which was huge. They also received the benefits of the energy consumption, which was a big one for this organization as well. So that was uh, a healthcare one that I wanted to highlight. Another healthcare example that um, I'll go to here is um, a large medical facility. We'll just say that way that this was still in the works as far as um, getting uh, approvals to use their name. What they have are, in a medical uh, environment, you have crash carts. So when you've been in the hospital, you see the, the trauma centers, you've got the carts with all the data, and the doctors, the technicians, the nurses need to access this information. So we were able to basically put a thin client right onto that cart, saving um, energy again with the low power consumption that we've got, the cost of the unit itself, and also the life. So we extend the life of the ability to um, get those types of uh, things onto the cart. Securely able to have doctors, nurses access that information. The other thing we've done is partner with an organization called Improvata, which does a technology called tap in, tap out, or tap over. And that allows, say, a doctor to come into a patient's room with this cart, pull up the records of that particular customer, that, or sorry, client that they need to see. They may run off to the next room. They, the next person, say a nurse comes in, She'll do or he'll do his part of that and access the information he needs with his swiper badge, and um, that's, that's accessed right from the cart via the thing client. So banking, um, and this one here is an account that is specific to GTC. Uh, banking is another industry where you have multiple branches, offices, different ways that people need to access the information. And um, this account here was one through GTC that was they had that need to roll these basically access to, to critical and confidential information in multiple environments. They were able to leverage our thing client that way. Their goal was definitely a cost saving one. And um, Chris worked very closely with the team here, and they were able to get that into, I think, up to about 1,100 users or so within that environment. And then we're going to cruise through a couple here. It's your typical use case. You're going to find us in every single vertical. We're not specific to any in particular. So um, any Citrix installation and deployment that, that you would want a secure lockdown endpoint, we can definitely facilitate that. Any questions on the use cases or specific to maybe your environments that uh, Dave and I can answer for you? In our environment, we have to log in on smart cards. Okay. Is that supported? And there's also filter requirements between back-end servers and the front-end you know, front devices. So, so the question was uh, with regards to smart card support and, and you said FIPS compliant? Um, so we're not FIPS certified, um, but the, the, the technology that we're using, because it I obviously have to be really careful when you start talking about that kind of uh, security and, and certification. Um, the, the Citrix receiver is, is developed in a manner that is, that is FIPS compliant, but it's not FIPS certified. 
So the, the intention, I mean, it, it, for those of you that know, to get that type of certification is a very, very lengthy and expensive endeavor. And any time you make a change, if you go from version 1 to version 1.1, you have to go through that certification process again. And it's very, very cost prohibitive. And so what we've, what we've elected to do, and in fact, I think most thin client vendors in the market have elected to do, is build it with that compliance in mind, but not get that certification because it really is prohibitive to do so. Um, from from a, a smart card perspective, um, if you're using a Citrix Access Gateway, um, then, uh, then smart card support works. Um, when you start talking about uh, authentication and peripherals, it, there's, there's a chicken and egg issue that comes up where you don't get uh, a USB connection from the server to that device until after you've authenticated. If you need USB to authenticate, but you can't get USB until after you authenticate, it becomes that, that chicken and the egg thing. And so what we, what we have to do uh, is, be, because there's no logic that's, that's truly running on the device itself, and there's no driver to actually read that smart card, capture that data, pass it up to the server, what we have to do is use Citrix Access Gateway that once you make that initial connection to the gateway, it opens up that USB channel and it allows you to pass that information straight through. And again, when it comes to security, you don't want a thin device to capture that data, hold on to it, and pass it at will, right? You want the device to say, I'm not even looking at that data, I'm just going to pass it to whoever's asking for it. I don't even know what it is. That's the, the, the much more secure way to do it. Does that answer the question? Okay, good. Any other questions? So um, in summary, I think we've, we've uh, kind of presented the end series. What you get with our device, and as we kind of stated, all the way through the chip, uh, where the manufacturer, where everything with this device, uh, you get the device, the vSpace Management Center that comes with it, and then we include a year of support on that device as well. So everything that you would need to support these devices in your environment. Um, and that's about what we've got to tell you today. So if you wind up having any questions or you're interested in getting some eval units, you can work with your reps at DTC. Chris, myself, any of us can get those out to you if it's of interest. Um, very simple process, just get in touch. And um, we hope to work with you. Okay. All right. Thank you.